arrest. He was taken by the Jewish council and uh, chief priest to Pilate. And it was there, you recall, that when he appeared before Pilate, that Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And as Melvin reminded us this last week in his series of lessons on Jesus, he said, it is, it is as you say. And then there were all these false accusations that were made against him by all of these Jewish leaders to which he had nothing to say, no doubt fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 that he would remain silent. He wouldn't give a defense like he so... Uh, capably could have given in defense of his integrity, in defense of his innocence. And you re recall that uh, it was the custom of the Jews, as was read for us a few minutes ago. I believe that was Landon who read that for us. It was the custom of the Jews uh, of Pilate to release uh, one prisoner every year at the Passover. And so he uh, you know, presented Barabbas, who was a robber, a thief. He was a rebel. He was also a murderer, presented a murderer before the people as one who was possibly to be released to them, as well as Jesus. And they chose, you recall, Barabbas. To which then Pilate said, What then shall I do with Jesus? You know, it was uh, really kind of a political question at that day and that time 2,000 years ago, but for us it's very much, very much a personal question. I'd like to take a few minutes this morning just to make application of this question, what shall I do with Jesus? You know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of things, a lot of people, it doesn't really matter in one sense, I mean, what we do with them. I mean, I don't know President Trump. There's some things I appreciate about him, maybe a, a lot of things, and there's some things I don't appreciate as much. But there's a sense in which it doesn't really matter what I do with President Trump, you know? There's a sense in which it doesn't really matter what I do with the possibility of voting for Governor K. Ivey or not. It doesn't really matter what I think about Nick Saban. It doesn't matter what I think about Gus Malzahn, in a sense. I mean, you know, as a Christian, I want to be kind to him if I ever cross paths, but I doubt we run in the same circles, you know. You know, there are a lot of questions we could ask, a lot of people that we could consider. There's a sense in which it doesn't matter, really. You know, I may never cross paths with them. I may never see them, may never get an opportunity to get to know them. But you know what really does matter? And there, there's a sense in which... Is, is the only thing that matters is how I answer the question, what shall I do with Jesus? You think that Pilate's going to be held accountable for what he did with Jesus? Do you think that those who were there, who were crying out to crucify him, that they will be held accountable if they didn't repent of their sin to, to have Jesus crucified? You know, I thought it would be fitting given the fact that for four days this last week, we learned about why we believe in Jesus last Sunday morning in the Bible class and Jesus being the Son of Man and learning in our gospel meeting about Jesus. And, and I don't know about you, but I thought it was a fantastic gospel meeting. I mean, from the standpoint of what we learned, what we were encouraged by, Jesus being the Savior of the world, Jesus being the mediator of for mankind, potentially, potentially being the Savior of the world as Christians, our Savior, learning about Jesus and being reminded of the fact that He is a friend of sinners. Great lesson that on Wednesday night that Melvin preached to us from God's Word. I thought it would be uh, fitting to uh, somewhat kind of end that meeting and, and begin a new week and, and meditate on for a few minutes today on the question, you know, given all that we've learned about Jesus, given all that we know about Jesus, what shall we do with Him? What shall we do with Him? Just real quickly, let, re, let me remind us what they did with Him at that time. You recall that um, Matthew chapter 27 indicates that, that those who, verse 30, uh, 39, that those who passed by, they blasphemed Him. 
Verse 41, the, the chief priest and the scribes and the elders, they, they mocked him. They despised him. That's what they had to say about him. Verse 44 of Matthew chapter 27, Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Those in that day, many of them, they just simply despised him. Even though he had been among them for about three years in his ministry, he had been on earth for about 33 years, serving as a minister of mankind, showing them proof that He was who He claimed to be. He was the heaven-sent, virgin-born. If they bothered to look at the prophecies, born in the right town, at the right place, at the right time, of the right person, there was something different about Mary, right? Who was the miracle-working suffering, sacrificial, about to be sacrificed, Lamb of God who had the ability not only to make a lame man walk, but to also, Mark chapter 2, forgive his sins. This is who was in their presence and they despised him. Just as a, a reminder, you know, uh, there are those today, it seems like in this country, a growing number of those who just despise Jesus. You know, we live in a day and time where one out of every five, four to five, one out of every four to five Americans claims no religion whatsoever, according to recent stats. Something like 33 to 30, excuse me, 34 to 36 millennial, 36 percent of millennials claims no religion whatsoever. There seem to be a growing number of individuals who think like the skeptic Donald Morgan does that Jesus taught few precepts that he himself did not violate. According to the Bible, Jesus was a hypocrite and not really perfect at all. Or maybe you heard about the story in 2006 of a newspaper at the University of Oregon, a student newspaper in which they portrayed Jesus hanging on a cross without any clothes on, kissing another man without any clothes on, in an inappropriate position and they titled the painting Resurrection. Perhaps you heard about the stand-up comedian Sarah Silverman who in 2005 joked that the Jews killed Jesus and she would do it again. She said twice in her stand-up comedy routine. And you would like to think that everyone in the audience would have gasped and booed or something or just got up and left. And yet you can listen to the clip on YouTube, but I would caution you in doing so because the small short clip I saw, there was one or two foul inappropriate words that were stated. But the audience just responded with laughter. You know, we might read Matthew chapter 27 and think that, um, you know, no one responds to Jesus this way today. No one despite, yes, they do. It seems that the further that our country gets away from the morals of Scripture, you see, and it makes sense, right, that they just begin to despise the light more and more the more that they swim and wander in in darkness. Some people despised Christ. Some went so far as actually to attempt to destroy Him. You recall that when Jesus entered the world as a man, as a baby, what was one of the first things that King Herod tried to do? The text says that when the wise men from the east, when when he realized that they weren't coming back to him to report to them, that he sought to do what? To destroy Christ. To destroy Jesus. So what did he do? He went out to Bethlehem and to the surrounding area and had every male child two years and younger slain in an attempt to destroy Jesus. The Jews wanted to crucify Jesus. And they were successful only because Jesus 
as the sacrificial lamb of God gave his life up, but people have sought to destroy him. Even Saul, before he became a Christian, you recall he was persecuting the body of Christ, Jesus. Jesus said on the road to Damascus that I'm the one, you're persecuting me, my body, my church. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 that he sought to destroy the church of God. And later in chapter 1 he says that he sought to destroy the faith before he became faithful to Jesus. Some people have sought to uh, destroy Christ. Some, in a sense, were somewhat successful, at least they thought they were. But Satan only bruised his heel because he rose three days later crushing the head of Satan. Well, you might be sitting here this morning, Eric, okay, I get it. Right here we read that they despised him. We can read where they sought to destroy him. I'm innocent of that blood, right? No, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. We're all guilty of something. Maybe it's not that, that we were there and, and that we would have done what they did in despising Him and, and hurling out blasphemous statements and reviling Him and wanting to destroy Him. But let me ask you this. What are we doing with Jesus? With all that we know, with all that we believe, with all that we are, some self-examination after our fantastic gospel meeting this last week, let me just ask you, what are we doing with Him? I wonder if some of us are kind of indifferent toward Him. You know, Pilate was indifferent, right? I mean, kind of, in a sense. You know, he cleansed his hands in kind of a ritualistic way. I'm innocent of the blood of this man. The attitude kind of was, just go do what you want to do with him. He scourged him, allowed him to be crucified. But I'm innocent of his blood. It was as if he was saying, I'm not really going to take a side here. I'm just backing away. My wife has warned me. You know, don't have anything to do with this man. So I'm just, I'm just going to back up. You just do what you will. But you know, he made a decision. His neutrality was a decision on behalf of the enemy. His neutrality was a decision for darkness. He made a decision in his effort to not really make a decision. You know, if you look up the word indifferent in the dictionary... This is what you'll read. Marked by a lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. Characterized by a lack of active quality. Those are just two of the few definitions that are there that Merriam-Webster gives for the word indifferent. Let me read that again. And again, I would just like for all of us individually to ask ourselves, does this describe me as a Christian? What am I doing with Jesus? Am I not that interested in Him? Am I not all that enthusiastic about Him? And I know that that can oftentimes, we don't have to, you know, depending on our personalities, we might be less outwardly enthused as some, but still, you know what it means to be enthusiastic there were millions of people around this world who were quite, around this country, who were quite enthusiastic yesterday when Alabama won and Auburn won and, and Ohio State lost. And there were a lot of enthusiastic people who stayed up late last night to find out if Ohio State won or not. Price, I see you over there smiling. I know you were one of them, right? We know what it means to be enthusiastic with sports and things. We know what it means to be somewhat enthusiastic in school with your work. I mean, with your jobs, you know, you, Allison, you're a school teacher, right? You know, you, you may not be standing up on your desk trying to teach from there and be somewhat crazy or maybe halfway effective in that way. I don't know. But you can be an enthusiastic teacher, Josh, right? And not necessarily be crazy. 
or just let it be, you know, you're just jumping from joy, uh, jumping for joy all day long. But are we indifferent about what we do as Christians and what we believe? Is there a lack of interest, a lack of enthusiasm, a lack of concern? What would that look like? You recall that when Elijah, when he was uh, there with the prophets of Baal and all those in, in 1 Kings chapter 18 there at Mount Carmel, he said, he talked to them about um, two opinions. And they had to make a choice, he said. How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, follow Him. But the people, they answered not a word. Maybe some of them were just trying to be neutral because it was controversial. Because maybe it would take some, some effort. You know, there's a song we sing, What Will You Do With Jesus? Is that our invitation song, Andrew? It's one of them, okay. What will you do with Jesus, my friend? I love this phrase in the song. Neutral, you cannot be. Because if you're neutral, guess what? You're indifferent. And if you're indifferent, you don't have any enthusiasm for the Lord. You don't have any care or concern for Him and His will and His people. Are we indifferent? What, what, what does God think about indifferent people? Well, let me ask you this. What did God think about the Laodiceans? I remember that church at Laodicea. And wasn't it so pleasant that they were not hot and they were not cold? They were lukewarm. And Jay's just laughing up here because he knows that's a problem. Jesus said, I know your works. You're not cold. You're not refreshing. You're not hot and all of the effective things you can do with hot water, for example. I could wish you were cold or hot. Revelation 3, 16, So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Just stop here for a second and ask this. If we are examining our lives this morning and we come to the conclusion that, you know what, I might be a lukewarm Christian. In fact, I think I am a lukewarm Christian. Well, just ask yourself this then. If you come to that conclusion, ask yourself, what does God want you to do? Does He want you and me, does He want us to remain in a lukewarm state? Absolutely not! He calls us to the same thing that He was calling people 2,000 years ago to do, to repent. At that time it was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and now it's repent and become a member of the kingdom and become not an indifferent member of the kingdom but an active, encouraging, serious this is my life kind of person, servant in the kingdom. Far too many of us, it seems, our, our servitude in the kingdom is like the priest who when the man fell among thieves from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he saw the man who was in need of help. And I'm not saying, you know, literally that this is what we would do, but sometimes our Christian life is this kind of what we are. We just walk on by our Christian responsibilities because we're too busy with everything else in life. Or maybe we're like the Levite who looked and just walked, walked right on by. You know, living the Christian life and, and being active about Jesus and, and with Him in His work, it's a daily grind, if you will, but it's a daily joy. Are you part of that grind? Are you part of that work, that effort? Or have we 
When, you recall in, in Luke chapter 13, that when the servant was sent out to offer, to give the invitation to come to this great feast, is our indifferent lives like those who gave these excuses? I can't come to that supper. I, I can't. I, listen, I bought some land. I got some property. I got to go check on. I can't come to this great supper. I can't be a part of this opportunity that has come my way because, oh, listen, I bought some oxen. I need to go test them out. Or listen, I got married. Okay. You know, at the end of that parable, Luke chapter 15, verse 24, and I know that in context this has to do with the Jews' rejection of the gospel of Jesus and or at least those who were should have known better, the scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders among the Jews. And so, you know, he went out to the highways and the byways and, and invited all to come in. Eventually, I think we could make application to this with the Gentiles. But for our purposes today, notice the end of the parable says, For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Are we indifferent about Jesus? What have you done with Him? What are you doing with Him? I think we all realize, Christians, that we understand that there are all sorts of opportunities for us to be about God's business, to be living the Christian life, all sorts of opportunities. And we understand that not everyone can do everything, right? We can't do everything. There's so much to be done. But you know, if everyone plays their part... Think about what all can be done. If everyone here plays our, a role, then you won't be indifferent. This church won't have indifference written all over it. You know, uh, in, in recent weeks, you know, we've had, we've had a work day here that Maybe you could have been a part of, maybe not. I know like some of my family were out of town. They couldn't be a part of that work day. We had a four-day gospel meeting that, let me tell you, I, I didn't even come close to hearing one person say that there was something even remotely wrong with one of those lessons. I thought they were some of the best gospel lessons I've heard. We've, uh, we've had supplies gathered for hurricane relief. We've had Bible classes. We have members who are in need of, of meals, of visits and other things. You know, there are a lot of opportunities. Everyone here is put in a care group. Think about that word care. It's a care group. You get to choose whether you want to be a part of caring with a group of people who are a smaller group of this congregation so that we can hopefully care for each other a little bit better. Are we indifferent about all of these things? You know, a lot of things that, that we aren't indifferent about, you know, a lot of times we're, we're not very indifferent. Depending on our job, we may not be very indifferent about our job because, I mean, we're going to be punctual, we're going to be there, we're going to work hard, we're going to put our time in. And that can be a very good thing. You know, maybe we're, we're not very indifferent a lot of times about our school activities, our work activities, our recreational activities. It just, it's amazing when we begin to evaluate ourselves, brothers and sisters, how indifferent we are. When you think about everything you do in life, sometimes it seems like we are more indifferent about the work of the Lord than everything else we're a part of in life. Come on! Let's examine what we're doing here. And listen, I'm preaching to myself too. There are times when I think I feel a little indifferent about some things. And I'm thankful. And that's the beauty about the church because we're sharpening each other. We're encouraging each other so that I can have my wife kick me in the rear end and say, get up and get out, you know. Or I can have, 
you know, Jason just slap me around a little bit and tell me to wake up here. Or, you know, that's what the church is, is for, to help each other. To help each other not be indifferent. To help each other honor Jesus and not dishonor Him. You see, some despised Him. Some sought to destroy Him. Some are indifferent about Him. And some people just continue to dishonor Him. You ever seen things that are considered, you know, honorable occasions or times that are quite serious, like a funeral? Have you ever seen or heard, like on the news, I know there's this group that go, they go around to certain funerals and they, they cause a big ruckus or commotion about things. It's been a long time since I heard about them, but I thought, how inappropriate is that? When someone is remembering the, the death of a friend or a family member and there's some dishonorable commotion outside, you know, I, I have to say, as, as an American who is thankful to live in this country, I, I don't get some of the things that are done when those who have died for our freedoms are remembered. At least I think that's what many of us remember when, when before a, a ball game or something else, the national anthem is sung. And it just seems like an occasion where we can just stop and be kind of thankful and remember the blessings we have, the freedoms that we have. Now, I am thankful that if people are going to protest those, that, that at least they're protesting it in, in perhaps the most respectable way possible if you're going to protest. But, I mean, come on, we understand that there are some things that are dishonorable and some things that are honorable. What are we doing with Jesus? You know, when, when Jesus, when He has recorded for us in His Word that He wants His people to assemble together on the first day of the week and that we're not to forsake this assembly in, in which we come together to remember as Jason led us in a, a few minutes ago the death of Jesus Christ and we choose to just forsake remembering that are we not dishonoring Him or we treat it so trivially like I might show up, I might not or maybe it's Jesus who's asking the rich young ruler as maybe he's asking us if we have this unhealthy attachment to material possessions. Go and sell whatever you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. You know, that man who chose to go away sorrowfully dishonored the king of kings by refusing to give him exactly what he wanted. You know, in, in the Old Testament time of Malachi... some 400 years or so before Christ, God said to Judah, He said, A son honors his father, Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am the master, where is my reverence? Yet you, you say, In what way have we despised your name? And then he goes on to talk about the polluting of sacrifices. Now you say, Eric, we don't offer animal sacrifices. We can't offer them incorrectly. Oh, yes, we can. Because I read in my New Testament that we are to be living sacrifices. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And so we ask the question, are we truly living sacrifices or are we phony sacrifices? Are we living a genuine life of service to the King of Kings what are we doing with Him? Or is our spiritual sacrifice more in line with these corrupted ones that are done, verse 10, even in vain? Or maybe it's because Malachi chapter 3 and verse 9, maybe we dishonor Him because we have this unhealthy attachment to material possessions that we continue to hold on to so near and so dear and we refuse to give, as we were reminded of a few moments ago, with great generosity and love and joy and a care for God's people that supersedes anything else in life. We give to Him 
our first fruits rather than being those who might be characterized, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, as those who rob God. Some dishonor Him. Some are indifferent toward Him. You know, some, they follow Him as long as it is, it is convenient and as they're getting what they want. You know, John chapter 6 is a very interesting chapter in Scripture where you have Jesus feeding the 5,000 in our lesson. We're about to draw it to a close. But Jesus was feeding the 5,000, you remember, with the five loaves and two fish. And it was an amazing miracle that, that He worked. And the following day, the text tells us that the following day, the people, chapter 6 of John, verse 22, that the people were searching for Him again. And what we read is, verse 26, Jesus said, You seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. He then began teaching them a lesson about about I am the bread of life. You need to be focused on spiritual things. He knows they had to eat. He knew they had to eat. But you know what we learn throughout this chapter? Really, once we get to the end of the chapter is, it seems that these people were so focused on physical, material things, and particularly in this context, the physical food that He gave them, that when He no longer was giving them physical food and was stressing to them the spirit of will of God, the words of life, the spiritual nourishment that the Bible says verse 66 from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more a lot of people decline Jesus once they realize that whatever physical things they were receiving had run dry. And I'm not saying they will ever run dry so that people won't have food to eat or clothes to wear, Matthew chapter 6. But brothers and sisters, it's a real thing that there are some individuals who are affiliated with God's people who seem to only want to have an attachment with God's people when they are getting some physical blessing from it. That's what John 6 was in part about. It's a shame. It's a dishonor to the King of Kings when people will be a part of the, the body of Christ when they're only getting what their physical needs met as they want them met. Some people show up for worship on Sunday only right before or right after they've received an amount of physical help. And of course, we're, we're so glad to have them. And it's an honor to be able to help people who are genuinely in need. But some people use Jesus just as they used Him 2,000 years ago. As we close this morning, let me just say this. Some people, they're not only indifferent about Him, they're not, they're not only dishonoring Him, rather than truly honoring and worshiping and serving Him, they no longer, they, they, they know not only maybe some of them just leave him, forsake him, decline his spiritual help, but are inclined to take his physical help. But they will just delay. Some will, will refuse by their delaying of responding to the invitation of our Lord. You recall, do you not, there in Acts chapter 24? as Paul had been teaching Felix. And Felix says there in Acts chapter 24 that, that he'd heard him concerning the faith in Christ and it was reasoned, it was preached appropriately. And the Bible says in verse 25 that Felix was afraid of Acts 24 and he said to Paul, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call you. When I have a convenient time. Christianity is not a religion of convenience. Brothers and sisters, it may be that 
we've made it one of convenience. We serve Him when it's convenient. We follow Him when it doesn't hurt me at all. We love Him when I don't have to labor for Him. We're studying the book of Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians in auditorium class on Wednesday night. I'm so impressed with those Christians who, by the time Paul wrote that epistle, they had only been Christians for a few months. And they were all in. They didn't delay coming to know Jesus, coming to obey Him, becoming Christians, even in the face of persecution, Acts chapter 17. They didn't that they weren't showing disinterest in the work of the Lord. They were so interested in the work of the Lord, even at a young spiritual age, that their, their fame, if you will, had spread upon different places. For when Paul wrote Thessalonians from Corinth, he told them that you had been and are an example. And there were people that Paul was running into who had heard about and seen with their own eyes, the faith of the Christians in Thessalonica. They weren't disinterested. They weren't dishonoring God with their love of possessions or with their refusal to be involved in the work of the Lord. And they certainly weren't in the body of Christ and active members for what physical blessings they had because the text tells us that they were suffering and that they were poor. They were dirt poor. But they loved Jesus. What shall we do? Before we're led in our invitation song, let me remind you the chorus of this song. What shall, what will you do with Jesus? Let me just read a few words from the song. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken, what meaneth the sudden call? Jesus is standing on trial still. You can be false to Him if you will. You can be faithful through good or ill. Will you evade Him as Pilate tried or will you choose Him? Whatever betide, vainly you struggle from Him to hide. Will you like Peter, your Lord, deny or will you scorn from His foes or will you scorn from His foes to fly, daring for Jesus to live or die? Jesus, I give thee my heart today Jesus I'll follow thee all the way gladly obeying thee will you say this will I do with Jesus what will you do with Jesus my friend neutral you cannot be someday your heart will be asking oh friend what will he do with me you need to respond to God's invitation this morning. Won't you do so as we stand and as we sing?